presentation. My name is Ina Panova. I work as a software engineer for Pound Team at Fitpath. Uh, the reason why we all gathered here is Pound. So please tell me how many of you already did have the chance to get familiarized with this project? Okay, great. And how many of you attended my presentation of that one? Cool. So in this session, uh, the guys will have the chance to learn about the school project and the ones who already know something about Cloud. I will keep your interest for that, so I'll show you the features that we recently implemented and some other neutral stuff. So the plan is I will fly through slides, I will give you the basic concepts of Cloud, I will show you some new features, some implementations, some demos, and in the end I will take a bunch of questions. So let's start. What is PALP? PALP is a platform for managing repositories of content. Imagine that on one hand you have a lot of content types like RPM packages, ISOs, Docker images, Python packages, and many more. And on the other hand you have a lot of repositories. In case you want to manage these two concepts by one tool, PALP probably is the right tool to be used in this case. Pulp supports many content types. Uh, it has such a flexible design that you can easily implement a new content type. We started with the Alter family when then we added support for Docker images and IDOS. How to add your own content type, I'll show you later in a couple of slides. I will talk about the new feature called Pull Through Cache. And yeah, we're completely open source. You can find all our code on GitHub, you can browse the source code, you can look at the pull requests, you can look at the input, you can even submit your own pull requests, where obviously uh, they're happy to accept contributions. And PALP is a Python web application, and by that you don't necessarily need to mean fancy graphical interface. Instead, we have a CLI, Command Line Interface, based on the REST API. So, uh, let's see where PALP is used and where you can see. PALP is used mainly by Recutter's engineering. What does Recutter's engineering do? It tries to deliver all the Recut products via CDN. CDN is Content Delivery Network. And the cornerstone of the CDN is PALP. PALP is also in public clouds. Uh, how many of you know about Amazon Web Services? Cool. So if you have ever associated an EC2 instance and put the updates that these were pulled from RUI, which is the cloud data infrastructure, and behind the RUI there is also PALP. You can also meet PALP in Catella, which is the upstream project for that satellite six. Uh, they decided to use PALP as a backend for uh, content management. And obviously PALP is used by our other community. Um, so, let's say you already have installed brand new fresh installation of PALP. Where do you start from? Usually you start from repository creation. When you create repository, you need to tell Paul what kind of content you're going to put inside so Paul can fetch the right plugins for it. And there are two ways how you can get the content into Paul. First way is you can synchronize it from a remote source, such sources like CDN, CentOS, so you can mirror them locally. You can do this thing manually or on a schedule. Another way how, to, how you can get the content into PALP is that you can create the repository and upload your own content into PALP. So once the content is inside, you can start and move it around. So for example, you can make a copy of this repository. And the main interesting fact that the copies are really cheap there is only one reference in the database, 
and just a bunch of synonyms that point to the file system of the actual storage location of the conflict unit. Um, so you can also filter out the content based on the criteria search during the copy. So there are a lot of things that you can do so you can mix and move around the content in power. Once you have the repository ready, so you're ready to make it available to the customer and clients, you want, you want to publish it. Publish means make the content available to the others. Uh, you can publish the repository and host this as a, as a web-based repository, so it will be served by Apache. For example, when you publish an RPM repository, it becomes as any other regular YAM repository, so YAM engines can get the packages. Or you can export into an ISO all this content. Um, there is a ranking feature that we implemented just a couple of days ago and it was merged. It can publish the content to the remote host. So the content can be available from the multiple remote hosts. It is really beneficial when you want to make the content highly available or available in multiple geographical locations at the same time. And is that different from what we call inter-satellite sync and satellite six? You call what satellite sync? Inter-satellite sync. You know how you can have one satellite server, have a second one? Okay. This one goes to the CDN, this one only goes to this one. Okay. Is that a pull function or is that different? That's I think different okay. because this is like a new feature. Okay. Um, yeah. I'll finish and probably you will have the answers. Um, you can publish all the content associated to the repository or only part of it, the one just with you. Need. The actual file transfer is made via SSH and RC. There is a special configuration where you can provide the host, the method of authentication, like the password or the key. Uh, you can also provide the directory where the content will be available in remote host. And this feature is available for Docker images, RPMs, and ISOs so far. Uh, so, as I said, PALP is not limited to any content type. So, in case uh, you still didn't find the content which is not managed by PALP yet, you can implement it by plugin. Oh, yeah. Uh, as I mentioned, there is the CLI, Common Line Interface, we call it PALP plugin. We can take a look. So, you say PALP plugin. You specify the type of the repository RPM, you create it, you, know, you provide the record ID, the feed, the URL for which you will fetch the remote content, and at this point the repository is created. Then you want to synchronize it. You say, see, run, and it runs. What is going on during the synchronization itself? Uh, basically, first we fetch the metadata. We yes. Okay, we fetch the metadata, we analyze it, and then we store all the metadata in the database. We figure out what kind of content we're going to synchronize, so we found out here are some RPMs, Delta RPMs, uh, some RPMs should be, yeah. Apparatus. So then we import the content into the repository <coughs> and at this point the synchronization is done. The content is into pulp. Let's look what kind of steps are performed during the publish. During the publish we create the metadata and we republishing all the content type which is in the uh, repository and we also create the scenes that point to the actual storage location. Uh, so, as I mentioned, you can 
uh, cost the users of the base record to facilitate the browsing of this registry. We decided to implement the recognition functionality. Uh, Recognition tool is a very popular tool that generates uh, static HTML pages from the record metadata. This is how it looks like the regular web-based repository. You can see the list of the content. And this is how it looks with the review functionality enabled. So as you can see, it's much more comfortable to get browsed. And the pages are done by the template, which are provided by the Repubit tool itself. And this type templates can be customized and adjusted by your needs. Um, do you have some questions at this point? Okay, so now let's move to the full to cache feature. In part, we have such a concept of the load policy, and by the load policy, you tell about how you want the content available. So there is an immediate download, which says basically synchronize the content immediately, so immediately download package by package by package on file system. And there is a deferred download which allows Paul to serve the content without actually downloading the packages and the content itself. Uh, there are two types of them. There is on-demand policy and background policy. What does the on-demand download? On-demand download skips the actual download of the files it downloads just the metadata, it passes it, and stores all the records of the database. Meanwhile, the content, which is the bits, are not on the file system, but you still can uh, make them available to the client. So, to make it easier, the content will not be downloaded <laughs> until it will be specifically requested by the client. So this is beneficial because you can save a lot of storage, right? Uh, the ground allowed is quite similar. I'm sorry. Yes. Um, so if if you do that, um, the first time a system registers to the vault repository and asks for an RBM, is that yum transaction? Is it going to time out and fail if I'm on a slow link? No. In a couple of slides, I will give you the okay. explanation for the works. You're taking the worst for I'm going to stop. I'm going to shut up now. <laughs> <laughs> so, background policy. Background policy is almost the same as like on-demand, but in addition to all the steps which are performed by on-demand policy, it creates a test in the background that package by package allows the bits on file system. Meanwhile, if task is running, the content is still available to the clients and to, to, to be used by Pulp itself. How does it work? So, the young client, for example, the young client requests some package, it talks to Pulp. The request goes to Pulp and the request is handled by a bot. What Apache does? Apache follows the symbol, which actually needs to point to the actual location of the package. If the symbol points to the existing location, that means that the package is present in the file system and the, the content is served right away. Yeah. If uh, the symbol points to an existing location, there is a fear to redirect and the request is, is forwarded to Squid. Squid, what does Squid? Squid caches the content. So we look into the cache and see if there is some content present, we stream right away the contents back to the client. If there is nothing in the cache, we 
<laughs> we forward this request to the pulp streamer. What pulp streamer is? Pulp streamer is a microservice which is responsible for the actual download of the content from the upstream repo. So pulp streamer goes to the upstream remote repo, downloads the bits, and streams it back to the client. Meanwhile, we have the content cached, and there is a task about that runs periodically, but it does. It goes into the speed into the ca in, into the cache, and it saves on the file system all the content which was allowed in the cache. So the benefit from this, the next time when the same package will be requested by the client, we will avoid to go through all this stuff and we will serve it directly. So the benefit of this, we call it lazy synchronization, is that you download the content at request time. So if you have, I don't know, some around 600 dollars in test thousands of packages and if you want to spare some, some storage you can enable this on demand policy. <sighs> Any questions about the on demand stuff? No. Uh, cool. You? Uh, I'm not sure if you keep them until the end or which one would be more comfortable. It's a question. It is an interesting question you can uh, it's an interesting later. question it's actually about this slide. Uh, um, my question is about signing packages. Well, you, you uh, first of all, they get signed, they, they got their static MVR and they're put in squid, and then it gets signed. It doesn't change the name, and but it actually changes the content of the file. Uh, how does Paul deal with that? We got a similar problem in OSBS, and we would like to know if this question has been raised before or, or not. I'm talking about the signature of the package. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it gets signed, so so it changes the concept, but it doesn't change the name. How do, uh, how does the squid handle that? Is it handled by squid, or you just try to avoid the situation? Uh, I don't think that it's handled by squid. What squid does is just fetches the content. Yeah, exactly. But it changes the content without changing the name. So you you're requesting a package, but it already has changed the content. The squid doesn't know about that. Oh. It will serve you the old copies because well. Yes. Well, you have a configuration where you can set a timeout. So if you put some short timeout on the cache, it will just cache the code for some. That is the question. Well, I understand you your need, question. You need to set it to uh, two hours, <coughs> which makes we basically useless. Or. In between that time out, we are setting this to a week. Uh, you will have a week of uh, well, potential so or I can tell you how uh, we synchronize the, let's say, RPM because uh, we look at the opportunity data, right? Ah, I see. So you forcibly uh, replace the package inside. Yeah. Well, you trigger the synchronization, right? You synchronize it once. Then you, for example, trigger the synchronization the second time. What we do at this point, we first look at the alternative data. If we see if the revision number changed, that means that something changed, so we resynchronize it. Revision, revision is in MVR? Revision number of the data. Oh. Okay. So if it changed, we do the same. If it didn't change, we nothing changed, so we skip the presentation. Good. That answers my question. Thank you. Cool. So the upstream metadata will change if the yeah, yeah. becomes so signed? That's the problem. The, the metadata will change, but the name of the package is the same. But, it's, but what you're saying is, in this case, if you accidentally promote something yeah, before it's been it. signed, but then go back and re-sign it since the upstream metadata is going to get updated, the version number of the metadata is going to change. Yeah. And it's going to, okay. I will do actually that. Yeah. Thank you. Yes? You said that there's a mechanism of uh, getting the content for, from the script to the Apache. Yeah. To the actual file system, yes. 
because uh, there is a thermal um, on, on the speed which you can set and when this thermal comes all the mm -hmm. So, so the Apache side is to be faster? Uh, well, if you, the, if you want the third chaos. <laughs> um, okay, the steamer, which is responsible for the actual download of the content, when it seems that the um, it's to the squid, uh, there is a colla collection in the database. So this streamer goes to this collection and makes a record there and says, okay, I'm putting this record of this package that it was downloaded and put in the screen. So there is a political task which is triggered. What task is doing? Task is going to the this collection and it has the list of all the content that was downloaded and cached. So it go so at least this on the on streamer side. Uh, the list is in the database. There is a collection of the database. <coughs> um, if you have some data in the further equation, we can well, it's, it's discuss like some... Curious, I'm curious how, how internally it works, but never mind. I can do that. Yeah, you can come to me and we can discuss it a bit later. Otherwise, maybe I will not take it in time to talk about other stuff. Um, so these are the current content types that we manage. So we have the RPM family, the ISOs, and the Docker images. We also have the fancy stream. We also do support for Debian and Slash packages. Uh, so with all this information that we have right now, what we can do and what kind of content we can manage, what are the use cases for how we can be applied? The regular use case is test dev production, actually dev test production. So let's say you're a development team, you create a repository development one. Uh, once you try you um, promote it by copying into the testing one, you perform the testing, and then you promote it again to the production one, so it gets available to the customers, right? Is there a useful uh, for testing upstream uh, content such as real point releases? Um, another use case is that you can mirror your Python package index, you can synchronize part of all of the packages from the pipeline. Uh, you can, uh, we, we do manage the source distributions and we recently added support for wins, which is pretty cool because wins is a to build uh, distribution format which is much faster than the source one, so it's faster. Uh, you can add your custom packages <coughs> by uploading them into the repository. And what one is one of the also think about how it can retain all versions. Um, imagine the situation when you've been um, I don't know building some framework which is uh, which requires a specific version of Python package, right? You build your framework, you go to PyPy, and at some point you can find this version because how it works with PyPy. When there is a new version, the old one, if you want to, you can find a new one. If you want to take control of this, you can use all for this purposes. You can store as many versions of Python packages as you need or not. Another use case is you can mirror Puppet Forge. You can do pretty same stuff as the Python packages. You can synchronize public modules, you can add your own custom public modules, and you can also store different versions of them into the repository. Uh, how much time I have left? Cool. So, another use case is that you can host and serve Docker content to Docker clients. In addition to Docker v1 format, we fully support Docker v2. That means that you can 
fetch from Docker Hub, Docker Console, and compose your own Docker repositories. Uh, in order to make them visible by Docker clients, so basically, if you want your clients to the Docker pool, you need to publish those repositories. So Crane can use them and serve them to the Docker clients. What Crane is? Crane is a small Python application which has, uh, the, which provides enough of Docker registry like API to provide Docker pool for clients. How it works? So you have the Docker registry, you have pulp, you synchronize the Docker content into pulp. At this point, pulp calls the Docker content. There is the Docker client who says Docker pool. So what Crane does? Crane sends the Docker content through the theoretical redirects, uh, which are going to the location where the actual content is stored and it's stored in pulp, right? So why do we need the publish? We need the publish because Crane loads all the data from JSON files, which are usually created during the publish of the repository. Okay, so I think I mentioned everything. What I wanted to say. Any questions? No. Cool. So, pulp uh, is scalable and extensible. Pulp uh, has such a flexible design that you can add the support to nearly all digital content type. Uh, the main core feature of pulp, like synchronization and publish, were implemented in generic way. So, the plugins can be so, so it can be extended by plugins which are responsible for the fact how to get the content into pulp and out of pulp, right? So when the plugin is installed, uh, pulp automatically discovers it. Pulp is also scalable. We can scale all different components of pulp depending on the purpose of the usage, right? So. For example, if you gonna have gonna manage a lot of content type, big repositories, that means that you will have a lot of metadata. We store just the metadata in the database. At this point it will be much better if you will have a dedicated cost for the database design. Does it make sense? Cool. Or for example, if you I'm pretty sure that one HTTP server will not be able to handle all the requests. It's better to have a couple of them. So, finally, let's talk about plugins. Uh, when you want to define a new content type, uh, you need to say what makes it unique. So, for example, what makes an RPA unique? Exactly, and they are. So you say, and our is making the RPA unique. At this point, we define the content type. Then there is an importer. This guy is responsible for interrogating the server, so going there, figure out what he needs to grab, how he needs to grab it, storing the pulp. So basically, he's responsible to get the content into the pulp. Then there is the distributor. Distributor distributes the content and it does the opposite thing of the importer. So, as I said, there is, a, for example, RPM repository. So, distributor from the RPM repository makes a regular YAM based here. Now, let's talk about the integration. Uh, was designed to be integrated with the build systems with the continuous integration testing workflow using the general, general REST API. Um, if you want a response, for example, to a successful publish, <coughs> you can have an event get published to an IMPP exchange. 
So you can subscribe to this topic exchange. There's so much going on. And at some point when it is needed, you can say, I want to kick a job, change the job, or something. Right? We also do provide the HTTP callbacks. So when there is, I don't know, some successful synchronization, there is a notification about it. Uh, this is a really nice way how to introspect what Pulp is doing and a nice way if you need to react on some actions. Uh, we also do provide consumer tracking, which is another interesting feature which is created by satellite. Uh, Pulp can, can help you to track uh, what is installed on each machine in your infrastructure and what update does each machine need which became recently available. Um, a lot of, we have a lot of asynchronous functionality going on. So we have distributed asynchronous uh, architecture where our REST API runs in Apache and we have all these long time jobs like simply publish, we try in separate processes, we call them working processes. So what workers do, they look at the, at the end of the queue, if there is some job, they take the job from that queue, for example they the sync. So they perform the sync, they look again into the queue and direct another job and another and another. So we use salary for this project, which is the main Python project, which is responsible for, for asynchronous functionalities. Oh, and I would like to mention our future plans. So you would know what to expect from us, or maybe you can provide your input or request. So we started the planning for pretty all. And the main big change is that we are moving from MongoDB to Postgres. A lot of people are happy about that. <laughs> yeah, this is this is pretty interesting because we use we, we are probably one of the most relational projects that uses a lot of relational things with non-relational database. Yeah. So we decided to make some changes and go to properly relational database, Postgres. Then he decided to use Postgres as a DB models and decided to use Django as much as possible, like uh, Django REST framework, uh, Django applications, so as much Django as possible. Uh, so my presentation is coming to an end. I give you the basic concepts of what what Pulp is, where it can be used, so probably you already have some ideas where you can apply it. And I want to mention that we have very extensive documentation uh, where you can find well, a lot of answers on your questions. And if you still will be in trouble, we will be really happy to help you on two more channels, Pulp and Pulp Dev. So, welcome to our channel. And Pulp got officially accepted to the Fedora, so you can easily download and install it. And another thing to mention is Pulp is distributed not just in RPM packaging, but we also distribute it as a document. So if you want to go and try in a couple of seconds, you can use document as to say the container and package it. So Get excited and make me things. <laughs> so I have a couple of questions. Yes. Uh, is there, let's say that hypothetically, you accidentally delete a symlink. Um, is there a tool to make it go through and regenerate those symbolic links? How do I do that? Um, you're thinking about the publish? Right, like, you know, because it creates about a million symbolic links, yes. it seems yes. like. And so if you actually deleted the wrong, <laughs> yeah. the wrong one, is there a way to force it to regenerate those? Yes, so we 
and we publish with every functional publish because recently we introduced such a concept of operational and non-operational projects. So let's say with every operational publish, we regenerate the metadata and recreate the scene. What means non-operational publish? Uh, means that it does nothing. So if there was no content added or removed or there was nothing changing the configurations, there is no point to read the old steps because nothing can change, right? So this is the concept of operational and non-operational Uh, it's about uh, Docker container tools. Uh, I think there is a nice uh, sync operation uh, which gets so uh, the content is put in, in bulk from uh, okay. Docker specific. Uh, isn't it possible to make it two way? I mean, uh, for Fedora it would be beneficial to say they are using bulk or um, any other big company um, using bulk. And they would like to make them uh, public, not just with the Docker containers, not just in their vault, uh, but also in a public uh, Docker I/O repository. So anytime they pull, they they create the, the, their packages and make them available using Gray. Can uh, it also sync with the uh, Docker I/O? Uh, is it possible? I've seen there are there was uh, HTTP callbacks mentioned. Uh, does it have that functionality? Uh, does the question make sense? <laughs> um, not really. So you, you want it. to publish pulp the Docker? Yeah, we would like to have uh, a pulp as a central part of our architecture to be uh, the only source of truth. But we also would like to make it sync with other uh, Docker registries. They <laughs> should not be used as a syncing uh, diagram. We just want one way to sync. Uh, so, when you say for the, you have a Docker registry, you have Pulp. What Pulp does, Pulp goes to Docker registry yeah. and fetches the content from Docker registry and plays them into Pulp. Yes, correct. Okay. And then we want the other way. We want both ways. The we other want way. one Docker registry where we use uh, to build packages, then we put them into Pulp, publish them, make them available. And then we want the, the reverse situation. We want uh, uh, polish to push back to India or Docker I.O. so people would just pull I Fedora. I don't think that we have Docker push. We just have Docker push. Well, it doesn't do that, but actually that would be very hard. Well, it, it probably doesn't do that, but will we'll, we'll the HTTP callbacks be useful uh, for, for the SPS? The HTTP callbacks so can be used to tell something else that, that's not the change. So something else would have to react to that and understand it. But if you wanted to add the ability for Pulp to push to it somewhere else, uh, that wouldn't be that hard. Oh, okay. I, um, we're maybe maybe we'll set up a, 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 a Jenkins server, which would be listening to that. But we would like to avoid it as much as possible. So I guess since it's not possible, we'll have to construct uh, something else. Yes. Uh, when uh, when uh, Bulb is uh, uh, once the Docker image is somehow put to the, under the uh, control of Bulb, okay. uh, does Bulb some inspection of the Docker image? Does it does it know what's installed in that Docker image? Um. Yeah. So what forms the Docker image? The blobs the manifest and tabs. So how knows about them? Uh, but not not the log does not go below that. Right. Like the log what? Layers? Uh, yeah, I mean Yes, let's imagine let's imagine the Docker Docker image which was created from Rail 7 and it has a list of packages installed. Does Paul know about that? I don't think so. It, it has just let's say general metric data. So all the other layers, the schema version, the tags and stuff. But it You're right, it's yeah, okay. I also have a question about the future plans. Yes. Uh, that Postgres migration, what's the what's the reason for that? Is it performance? Is it new features? Uh, the reason for that is that 
as I mentioned, we, we, with time, it becomes much more difficult to manage a lot of relational data with non-relational yes, database. Because we, we've been using we have a couple of scripts, uh, a couple of MongoDB abstractions, like feels like cheating, but now we have to somehow replace it. Shall we have some kind of a pass uh, to the SQL of what, so we could say, I think we were using, uh, I don't know what that, amount of tasks running still, or not. So that, that migration to Postgres might break a couple of scripts we were using. But um, that's not the reason it just right there. So what's your actual question? The question is, what's the reasoning to move to Postgres? That's, that's basically the uh, yes. problem. Yes. Uh, uh, we've been planning for it for quite a while. Some time about that migration from Logan to Postgres, and a lot of people were requesting to be moved from non-relational to relational. I think that's the main that's the main driver is the fact that it's an RDBMS instead of yeah. And yeah. yeah. I think the, the problem is Mongo did not work in Right. Uh, so why are you doing a long operation? The data changes. And so you're using the same way it's been used for the time. Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah, that's a good problem. Well, and I mean, just from a from a commercial standpoint, having it as Postgres instead of Mongo means that as we move into satellite, now we've got one database instead of Mongo over here and Postgres over here, and we're kind of wedging them together. Yeah, so that, that makes it nicer. Um, so I, I, I have. I'm sorry. Go ahead. I have one question. Do you talk about uh, Python cloud and Puppet cloud of cloud that can save all the uh, packages. Is that the same for the RDNs or not? Uh, yes. There is an option called retain old versions. So by default it's set to zero. So basically it retains the oldest one. But if you set to two or three, it will keep two or three versions depending on the set itself. Okay. Yes? Uh, what the how difficult it is to introduce a new format for your cloud. Uh, can you repeat the question? Uh, what, uh, which tasks needs to be done to introduce a new format? Uh, you mean the new content type, right? Yeah, content type. Okay. So let's say you want to implement the provisions, right? Yeah, for example, policy modules for the CMS policy. For example, policy. Policy module. So this is more, oh, okay, yeah. so that's because, a Because uh, policy, SNOX policy uh, changes a lot, but the applications, uh, for example, there are two applications interacting, and uh, their behavior has not changed, uh, but somehow somebody tried a new scenario, and now we have to update SNOX policy, so, Okay. Could we, could we somehow distribute? Sorry, is there a client version of the model? Uh, policy modules for uh, yeah. There's a uh, client. Uh, basically, uh, SNOX policy is a bunch of policy modules. Yeah, and uh, there is some trend for uh, each product will bring its own policy yeah. and the products have different life cycles and so on yeah. and uh, the old way was with each change of a serious policy which is required by some product we will ship uh, a serious policy whole package yeah. but it's not necessary we can just ship the one policy model which was required by the product yeah. so can we use Somehow. Yeah, so theoretically you will use plugins and you will define what makes this module unique mm -hmm. and then you will try you need to write the important definition and distributed definition. We have the documentation quite extensive how to do that. Uh, but with the Fidito plugins we're gonna do some plugin API changes. So there is a chance that we will a bit rework the general concept of policy 
but but yes, answering your question, if you want to add some you know, support for new country type, you basically follow these requirements in this way. Any other questions? You don't have any? I think I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> You were asking about the satellite, satellite thing. That's not, she was writing, um, yeah, I, I, I think the satellite thing is being changed with 6.2 though, also. Yeah. It used to use something called Geosimple, which we are trying to get rid of. And then it now does, what it really does is the secondary one just sets up the other one as the It's the upstream. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Yep. Cool, so if no more questions, Thank you for your service.